Are the walls of the physical classroom dissolving rapidly? Are we moving to a world where preferences are changing? And like so many areas, banking, for example, are we seeing power moving to the individual or away from the, the center to the periphery so that the individual can choose which global class to attend and at a time that suits the person and not the class schedule. Today, Ray Ban said they've integrated their cool shades with Facebook smart tech for sunglasses that can take pictures or video on your voice command with those built-in mics as well and little tiny speakers. It's touted as the latest device to keep you connected while you are out in the physical world. So one foot in the physical world, but maybe thinking and filming stories for the virtual world. So does immersive tech mean that a new gateway to a future campus, even more independent of physical space, is being built as we speak. I so enjoyed the last time I spoke with him on air. I invited Dean Ilion Mihov, who's Dean of INSEAD, to join us again, and I'm thrilled that he's taken up our invitation, this time to discuss the future of the campus. Dean Mihov, how are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again, Michelle. And if you're listening to us, welcome to a conversation with the Dean of INSEAD, Ilian Mihov. Today, we're discussing whether the COVID enforced shifts to online learning marks the beginning of the end of the physical campus. So, um, Ilian, do you think that the physical campus is going the way of the bank branch? I can't remember the last time I stepped into my bank branch. Well, uh, I think that we have different functions than bank branches. So I think that the physical campus is not going away. I think it, it will change. The functions that uh, the physical campus will be fulfilling will be different than in the past. And online will be very important. But um, I think it, the, the campus is here to stay. It's for quite a long time. I thought it was really fascinating. I read an article that you wrote for uh, Harvard Business Publishing, and you said that Team Viewer and Team Viewer is so critical to so many organizations, right? Um, they were one of the first to come back when you resumed physical learning. Is that right? Learning on the physical campus? Yeah, they, they were back. They were eager to come back because they realized that the interactions that are happening between the participants after the class, uh, during the class, the discussions are so critical in the learning process. And uh, if you're sitting uh, in front of your computer and you know, you're listening to a great lecture, but then you don't have time to interact, you retain much less than if you right away start discussing this concept. So they were very eager. They were very happy to be back on campus. Yeah, I thought that was a great case study that team viewer themselves enabling all of us to work remotely wanted to come back and saw some value in being physically present. Um, but, you know, Dean, lately I've been doing some research. I'm going to be moderating a panel for a dating app. They're called Bumble. And um, so I haven't had to date in a long while, but I got on Bumble and I checked it out. And I realized there's so much social interaction happening just in different spaces. So do you think this idea that we need to be on campus in order to build relationships is being supplanted? Thousands of people meeting, getting married on these apps because the, so, much, so much interaction is happening in maybe a different space. I think that it's a very interesting way to phrase the question. So first, I'll address it in this context of uh, dating apps or Facebook and so on. But first of all, you know, if you look even at our students, right? So young people, much you know, more, much closer to this new digital world than I am. And yet, last year, only one out of five hundred students said that he will continue. He will do actually his course online if it was fully online. All the others said that they will postpone if it is all online. So the demand is there. And, and again, I think it, we, we have to recognize that the learning process is a bit more complex than just receiving information. If it's just receiving information, you don't have even have to go to university. You know, look, you know, I have tons of books here, you know, just read the books and that's all. You don't have to go anywhere or you just watch videos. But the learning process involves um, what I call horizontal learning in another article that I wrote, where people interact and after the class, they start, you know, you, you go to the cafeteria and you say, you know what, I really didn't get this concept. Or, you know what, the same thing that we were discussing happened also in my company. 
And in this process, you reinforce the learning and that's what you retain. If you're just passively listening to information, it is very, very difficult. Now, going back to your Bumble example and so on, you know, I have been really puzzled lately so many times. You know, you go on Facebook and you see these happy people, happy families, only to learn later that, you know, they're actually getting divorced and, you know, all these things that you see on social media. Maybe not 100% of the time, but in my experience, most of the time, have nothing to do with reality. So the way that you sometimes project yourself and communicate in the digital world is very different than in person. And this, I think, it is very important. The body language, the way that you, know, you say things, the way that you, you talk to people reveals a lot during the conversation. Good point, Dean. Now, you, you talked about that study, and I know that happened in the midst of the pandemic, right? When you asked INSEAD students whether or not they would switch to fully online courses, and then only one out of 500 said they would. Now, I wonder, do you think perceptions could have changed after the pandemic? A lot of people were not used to working from home, but now you talk to people and anecdotally, they say, I don't want to put my work clothes on and go out anymore because, you know, I, I've come to appreciate the joy of working from home. So do you think, um, you know, whether or not students say they would like to switch fully to online courses may have changed after the experience of COVID? Uh, no, I think that uh, uh, it hasn't changed. Um, you know, sometimes if you offer the opportunity in the last minute, do I go to the classroom or do I stay on Zoom? You wake up in the morning, you're a bit lazy. You may say, let me stay on Zoom. But if people think hard about this and if they take it rationally and seriously, Everybody wants to be on uh, on campus. Everybody wants to interact and to talk to friends, and and it's not even just the students. You know, we have these alumni you know, spread all over the world. So in 2019, we had to cancel. Sorry, 2020, we had to cancel our reunions. 2021, we had to cancel the reunions because of the travel restriction. You have no idea how many emails I have received that, you know, you cannot do this to us. You cannot have digital reunions. So next year, we're having classes that were supposed to meet in 2020, classes in 2021 and class in 2022, coming back for physical reunions because the demand is just so strong. It's, uh, I mean, the pandemic uh, has changed a lot of things, but if anything, I would say that the eagerness to meet in person and the demand for this has gone up, not down. And yet, INSEAD has not shied away from immersive technology. I know you've talked about in the article, for example, headsets that allowed people to remotely uh, enter different workspaces. So can you share with us maybe how digital learning, um, how, how has it worked for INSEAD? It has worked great. So I think it actually, it, it's now a cliche to say that, you know, the future is blended, right? So they're, they're just obvious. It's like almost like saying, you know, in the future we'll use computers and uh, mm -hmm. iPhones and so on. Yeah, of course we will. Uh, what form they will have, we don't know. But uh, I think that uh, what is important to understand is that the physical interaction is something that is very, very difficult to be replaced with the online interaction. Online interaction, however, has another role to play. So you can deliver information and you can deliver content, content online. But if this is the whole story, then you're missing probably about 40 to 60% of the learning. And again, you can make it, you can increase it so that you miss only 20% of the learning. But it also depends on what kind of courses you're taking. So the online courses have worked really well in specific areas. I think in a way it's more technical. It's not so much about you know the managing people, soft skills, um, not so much about discussion, but just pure content delivery. They have worked really well. And they'll continue helping us. But even in this case, I think that there is one very important fallacy out there. And it is that knowledge is finite. The fallacy is that, you know, this is the content you have to deliver. Once you deliver this content online, in a book or in any other form, you're done. And that's not true at all. In fact, I'm so happy that we have mastered the digital delivery because now what we can do, I can have a video for the students, 
giving them the basic definitions, the basic concepts, so then when they come to class, we actually start thinking about this, debating, discussing, so that actually they can learn. I'm a macroeconomist, so I can I can just shoot a video about monetary policy. So that when I come in class, I don't have to give them definitions of things, but we can say, okay, what is the Fed doing now? What will the European Central Bank was just announced, this announcement, what does it mean? And this is the discussion that not only you are solidifying your learning, but you're preparing for the world out there. It's much more practical than just the, you know, the delivering of the content. So what is your message to educators then um, who note that things are changing, spaces are evolving, so will the campus. Do you have a sense of you know, what, what this evolution is going to look like? So I think that uh, I, I would say still pay attention to campus. Campus is very important, but build it in a way that will allow more interaction. Build the classrooms in a way that people can even during class interact more. Build your lectures in a way that allow more interaction. Pull out of your classrooms things that can be delivered. Like you know, it, it's almost the same thing as saying I assign textbooks or I assign cases or assign articles before class. Okay, now I'm assigning you videos. So here's my online course. This is lecture three. Go and watch it before you come to class. And then, you know, this will help you learning. So build this. The other thing that also I think is very important is that when we talk about online, everybody assumes that, oh yeah, of course people can do it from their home. But it's not true for everyone. In fact, I think at universities, are a big way, if, of course, if the admissions is done properly, if there are scholarships and so on, but universities are a very important component of uh, helping people that are coming from poor backgrounds, helping them actually getting into an environment where they can learn, as opposed to staying at home where it's noisy and probably they don't even have a room so uh, where to study. So the university is a place, it's, it's a social equalizer in many ways that will allow somebody who does not have the facilities to, to, to move forward. At the same time, online also has this advantage because sometimes the travel costs are too high or, or, or people, by the way, a very interesting statistic in our executive education classes. In our executive education, not only the INSEAD, but in general, there is in most courses, not all, but in most courses, there is a gender imbalance. So there are more men than uh, women. But in online courses, the percentage of women is much higher than in in-person courses. It's a very interesting statistic. I think it's something that is worth, you know, digging deeper into and studying you know, why is it's the case. Mm. So obviously online delivers to a different segment as well. It's not just you know, the same people who will come on campus now stay at home. There's some people that cannot come on campus. So I, again, I think it's a, it's a mix of the two things. Do we have a sense of the different spaces, whether physical or virtual, and its impact on learning outcomes, Ilian? Well, I think that, uh, again, I think that it depends on the course, on the material that you're teaching. Uh, in terms of the learning outcomes. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, online is good enough. And we have some professors that are just so good at online. Th they have better ratings than in person. And yeah. because they, they master the equipment, they know how to engage with, with the people, with the students. They know mm -hmm. how to project themselves while there is a screen with the, all the materials, show video. I mean, they're just fantastic. But, you know, there are some courses where, or some even audiences, where mm -hmm. um, you, cannot, you cannot do this. I mean, I remember one of our professors, Erin Mayer, who wrote uh, recently the book with uh, Reed Hastings, The uh, No Rules Rules. And before that, he ha she, has an, yes, on the, and she has an amazing book on, called The Culture Map. And she talks about how people behave in different uh, in different cultures and how it's very important to understand that uh, you, you might think that somebody is rude or you might think that somebody is disengaged when it's just 
you know, it's it's a cultural behavior. So the example that I remember from her class, I actually attended one of her classes to <laughs> learn cross-cultural management. That's cool. <laughs> so she she was saying, you know, she was invited to give a lecture in Japan. Mm-hmm. And um, she's going, you know, after an hour and a half, she has a break. She goes to the person who was organizing the lecture, the HR person, and tells her, you know what, I don't think that the class is going very well because nobody's participating. Nobody has any questions. And it's kind of like I'm just talking and that's not what we normally do. And the HR said, well, wait a second, you don't understand. So she then, Erin, continued. And then towards the end, the HR came in the front and said, you know, do you have any questions? And everybody's sitting there. And at some point, she points to one guy there and says, yes, tell me what you think. And Erin asked her, how do you know that he had a question? And she said, well, because in Japan, when they look at you, they want to ask you a question. So she said he was just wow. looking at her without raising his hand, without anything. I mean, I don't know whether this is true or not, but she was sharing this experience. And I'm thinking, you know what? I cannot do this on Zoom. You know, in the classroom, I can understand who is uh, in the class, who is really listening, who is... But, but if you're on Zoom or any other platform, you cannot do that. It's it's very interesting, and um, that's why I still think it will need the classroom for some time, at least for you know the, this generation and probably the next one. After that, we don't know. Well, that was great. What a great example, and thanks for the, the book suggestion as well, Dean. This has been a wonderful conversation. So it looks like in your books, it's not the end of the physical campus, at least not yet. No. Right? No. I think okay. there are a lot of functions and it's, uh, you know, just going around and seeing people with the energy and it's just, it, it, and they build friendships. I mean, at the end of the day, there are a lot of functions of getting together, right? It's not just the learning, but, you know, our alumni stay together for the rest of their lives. There's so many of them. I'm shocked by this statement, by the way, but so mm-hmm. many of them say, mm-hmm. this was the best year in my life. And I'm thinking, really, you know, you, you're 85. You know, that's the best thing in your life when you were at INSEAD. And he, the guy said, yeah, it was like, you know, Fontainebleau and, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, when you see them at weddings, uh, you know, baptisms, at all kinds of uh, anniversaries, they're all together. And, you know, getting friends in this world, you know, where physical interaction becomes more and more difficult is something that is invaluable. Priceless. Yeah, I, and that's a great case study. I think a lot of companies will, will want to know how does INSEAD build communities so well so that these bonds can be forged. That's interesting in itself as well. Dean, thank you for joining us. We're fresh out of time, but we look forward to welcoming you back uh, next month for another conversation with the Dean. He's Dean Ilian Mihov, Dean of INSEAD. Have a wonderful day, Ilian. Money FM 89.3